Hello, everyone, and welcome to a surprise, kind of a surprise, Man Do Live. And I am excited to let you all know that we have a guest on today to actually be here to talk, to comment, to share information about the parole hearing that we are about to watch. Um, and many of you may know who this is, is Kejun Overcomer, um, our local Louisiana native. And we have done one of uh, a parole hearing about her in the past. Maybe you've seen it, maybe you're in the live chat and you've seen her in there. But if you're not familiar, you're about to be. Actually, right here on the screen that we're looking at is Kejun Overcomer standing, sitting next to Miss Stapleton, the new survivor advocate. Um, and we can maybe check this out um, if you want to learn more about Miss Stapleton, the survivor advocate. But I think we're first going to start with the parole hearing. But first, let me bring onto the stage the one and only Kejun Overcomer. Hello, hello. Mic check, mic check. I'm here. Oh, here we go. It's so good to hear <laughs> to hear your voice over the screen. How are you? Oh, I'm good. <laughs> With today, this kind of ironic today. We're doing this today, but I'll tell you why later. Well, why don't you tell us now? I think that could be interesting to know before um, we get into it. Oh, okay. Um, well, like I told you in the chat about the person that's sitting behind me in that um in the thing with Carolyn. Our okay. four term governor, yeah, the blue the one in the blue shirt. The our four term shirt. governor, Edwin Edwards, passed away a couple of years ago today. That oh, governor wow. is who commuted his life sentence. So today is not happening by accident. Got it. So so for everyone who's watching, the man on the right sitting behind Kejun wearing the blazer and the blue shirt, he, he um, is a fender of the worst kind. And his sentence was commuted by the governor who, who, is, uh, who passed away um today or no four years um, ago today. Two years ago today. Two years ago today. Two years ago today. So there's some irony yeah. here. Yeah. Wow. So and I'm looking at the chat. If maybe you could say hello to everyone who's waving. Hey Sandy. Hey Melanie. Welcome evolving off the grid. What's up? It looks like Carol said hi to you, Kejun. Um so hey, I think what we're gonna I love the y'all. We got real Louisiana native here. So I got, um, so I think what we'll do is we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll watch the hearing and um, you can feel free to, if you want to interject or comment during it. Um, otherwise we'll, we'll, you'll see, so you'll let, you'll let me know. You can, you know, we'll both go on mute, but you can just unclick the mute and say, Hey, I want to say something. Or we just go okay. through it and, but we'll play it like that. We'll be, you know, I would like it to be, I guess, as natural for you as possible. I know this can be emotional. T talking about Duquette has become second nature to me, unfortunately. Got it. Well, um, so so what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go off. So, yeah, so we'll go off the screen. Oh, I think I just stopped talking. Does that sound good? Yes, hey, sir. Evolving. All right. And again, for those of you who are just coming in, we're about to watch the parole hearing of a monster of a roach. Um, Kejun is a survivor, and she speaks at this parole hearing. We're good. There's no. I should bring to your attention. It's it's a it's a. It, there's no video. This was done before they were starting to do video. So we're just going to listen 
um, to this hearing. But you are going to recognize Mr. O'Shea and Ms. Renatza. And of course, you'll hear our very own Cajun Overcomer. Hey, Raccoon, thanks for being here. So with that, let's jump in. Good morning, sir. Mr. Duque, would you please state your full name and your Department of Corrections ID? I'm Michael Duquette, 336-250. Thank you, Mr. Duquette. My name is Alvin Roche, and I will serve as chairman today. To my left is Ms. Cheryl Renaza. To my right is Ms. Pearl Wise. Let me explain the process to you. I will read some information into the record Afterwards, we will conduct a parole interview with you. At the appropriate time, one Vinoy will give remarks. If you have any family members, we'll give family members a chance to make a statement on your behalf. Yes, sir. At the very end, before we vote, we will allow you to make a statement on your behalf. If there's any victim, if there's any victim opposition at headquarters or here at Southern University's Law Center, we'll give them a chance to make a statement. Do you understand the process? Yes, sir. Mr. Duquette, you are a second felony offender, your offenses are indecent behavior with a juvenile, four counts, oral sexual battery, one count. You were sentenced on July 24th, 1994. You were revoked on July 2nd, 2008. Your sentence was five years at hard labor. Each count of the indecent behavior and 10 years for the oral sexual battery. You have a total sentence of 30 years. Is that correct? <clears throat> yes, sir. Your parole date was, matter of fact, your parole date is March 25th, 2018. Your good time date, March 28, 2021. And your full term date, March 23rd, 2037. Is this information correct? I believe so, sir. <laughs> We have opposition at the hearing. Uh, would the opposition please stand? Would you please give your full name and your relationship to this offender? My name is Kathleen Marriott. I'm an assistant district attorney in the 19th Judicial District appearing on behalf of the state and the district attorney's office who opposes. Yes, and you would like to make a statement? Yes.
Has the sound stopped? Okay. I was hearing everything fine, so let's figure out why. I'm making sure I'm hearing. I didn't leave. Okay. Um, that is very strange. Let's figure out why this could be happening. Huh. I have no idea. This is so weird. Let's see. I'm going to refresh because it, that's weird. I, I heard everything fine. Um, so that is, I, I can't figure out how that would have happened. But let's. Uh, Um. All right, let's try again. Make a statement on his behalf. Do you hear it? Ms. Raymond, Ms. Raymond, would you start the interview, please? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Rochelle. Good morning, Mr. Ducat. Good morning, ma'am. You doing all right this morning? Yes, ma'am. Good. So, uh, as Mr. Roche said, uh, your total sentence was 30 years, and you were convicted uh, of four counts of indecent behavior with a juvenile in the oral sexual battery. Uh, as I uh, read the record, uh, I think you were initially charged with 49 counts. So, could you share with us how many victims are there? Five. Five. Five And what were the ages of those victims? Do you recall? Eight. What was the ages of you there? I think like nine to thirteen. Nine to thirteen. And what was your age at the time? I was around twenty-seven. <laughs> and so when you were sentenced back in nineteen ninety-four. Um, you were afforded the opportunity for probation. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And uh, I think you maybe left the state and um, went to Texas, where um, in, 19 in, in 1999, you were convicted of uh, a sex offense with a, with a minor there. And received a 10 year DOC sentence, is yes, that right? Yes, and so, consequently, your probation was revoked in Louisiana. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, I wanted you to be aware uh, your, your family lives in New York, is that right? Yes, ma'am. My mom and dad, and the rest of my family in New York, and my two brothers in Florida with their families. Okay. We did receive uh, a letter from your parents as well as a video um, where they're speaking on your behalf. And we wanted to play that video this morning. So, John, can you play that for us now? Hello, Mr. Rochelle. Hello, Mr. Rochelle. Hello, Mr. You'll be able to hear it, but you won't be able to see it. Uh, okay. Oh, poor old boy. We are Bill and Lois Duquette. Parents of Todd M. Duquette. We live in Cortland Manor, New York, which is about 50 miles north of New York City in the lower Hudson Valley. I've been retired from General Motors after working there for approximately 30 years and presently have COPD, including emphysema and chronic bronchitis, which makes it pretty difficult for traveling. I've spent my life raising our four children and helping to raise our grandchildren. 
We're asking you to grant release to Todd. He has done his full sentence and has been a model inmate, having a totally clean disciplinary record. We have always been there for Todd through phone calls, letters, and emails through JPay, as well as financial support as needed. We will continue to support him, as will his brothers and sister, and whole family through finances, clothing, encouragement, and our total love, and anything else he may need. We know that Todd will be a law-abiding citizen if given the opportunity. He has been through so many programs, which we have sent to you in a letter containing such, including seven years being a tutor. Todd graduated from a Christian college and received a BS in education and an AA in ministry, which he has been using while incarcerated to help others become better people. Todd has grown exponentially in Christ and brought many Philippine <coughs> inmates to know the Lord. Thank you for your sincerely for your time, and we pray that you will grant Todd release. In Jesus' name, God bless. Amen. Mr. Duquette, I, I just thought you needed to be able to hear that. Um, let's talk about your institutional uh, record. Uh, we do, as part of the process, we get an institutional progress report on, on the work done uh, by the offender, and you've earned 420 days of good time credits. And so yes, yes, the, um, you have numerous certificates in your file, but let me just go over a few of those uh, programs. You completed all phases of the sex offender treatment program. You completed anger management. Uh, you do have some vocational skills and numerous agricultural certifications, which as I understand is hard to do. Uh, it looks like in 2000, at least with the information I had for 2017, 18, and 19, there is occasional participation in a faith-based program. That's what's noted in the record. Um, you, uh, also, for those same years, you have seldom visits from your family that we understand in New York and out of state. Uh, in terms of club participation, the record indicates that you participate in Toastmasters and the uh, Gavel Club. You've done well in your educational classes. You have a really good conduct record. You've been incarcerated, what, uh, 11 years uh, with only two write-ups. So I want to commend you on, on uh, a, a good conduct record. Um, you've had a recent uh, mental health evaluation, which indicates your uh, your mental status is within normal limits. So, um, considering some of the info and I, some of the info that we've talked about, I want you to tell us why you believe you should be afforded early release. Um, I wish to say this first of all. Uh, as far as my participation in faith-based, I, I, I'm a strict uh, church member of Full Gospel. I'm uh, one of the prayer warriors, very involved in the prayer team and the revivals they've been having around here. Very much involved in ministry and have been for. I mean, pretty much uh, back there at Camp C and and since I've been up at the main prison. But as far as why should you give me early release? Well, I, I don't come I don't come as if it's a right. I understand here after 21 years of incarceration, I understand privileges, not rights, privileges. And it would be a blessing to get out there. It would be a blessing to apply what I've learned in here. It would be a blessing to help more people. It would be great to be a productive citizen. It would be great to have another chance at society. It would be great to uh, get a chance to uh, uh, make up for my past crimes. I can't blame anybody but myself. I take full responsibility half from the get-go, and I'm a changed man. As far as dessert, I mean merit, I... I have conduct, I have behavior, I, I have heart, I have character, references, but 
I'm simply humbly asking for mercy because that's what it boils down to is mercy. Okay. Well, let's talk about, uh, we, we do in the record, have opposition that's been expressed. There's opposition. Uh, the sentencing judge will hear from the district attorney's office shortly. Uh, the chief of police in Baton Rouge also has expressed opposition. Uh, during the investigative process, uh, we were unable to locate victims, but I'm anxious to hear from the uh, district attorney's representative in that regard. Uh, we also do a risk assessment score and um, your risk assessment score on the Tiger, which is a new tool we're using to assess risk, you you rate moderate. You're a moderate risk to reoffend. We also do a uh, static 99 risk assessment for sex offenders, adult male sex offenders. And in that category, it's concerning because you rate in the moderate to high category to reoffend, and you were one point away from being a high risk. So that is concerning to me. Um, I don't have any other questions of you, Mr. Duquette. I'd like to see if Warden Vinoy may have something he'd like to add. <laughs> no, no ma'am, uh, take care of the I think you went through it. I don't, I don't have anything up there. Okay, thank you. Mr. Roche, I have no other questions. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Ms. Wise? Uh, Mrs. Duquette, uh, do you have any supervision on your Texas charge? Uh, did you full a term on that charge? Uh, on the Texas charge, I full termed in prison. All right, all right, thank you. That's all right. I was undetained. Sir? Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was on detainer from Louisiana while, while all the time I was there. Okay. All right, thank you. That's but I was in prison. Okay, so you have no supervision uh, outstanding in Texas as parole or anything? Um, I went through the Team Challenge. I went through the Team Challenge program and graduated. And I went to the sheriff's office. He sent me to the city police, and they sent me to their the lady that works with sex offenders. She contacted Miss Murphy, and then Miss Murphy told me to get with her. I did. And she said she couldn't do anything until she heard from Ms. Murphy, and that was the end of that. I just, I just lived in an apartment, got out, lived in an apartment. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you. That's all I had to. Thank you, Ms. Wise. Uh, Reverend Rent, would you like to make a statement in, uh, for Mr. Duque? Thank you, ma'am. I've uh, I've known Mickey for about 35 years. He came to Bible College where I was a professor. And uh, I've known him about 35 years. My reason for being here today is I've known him. I also contacted his family to try to get them to come. And they, as you heard on the video, they, they're not able to come. They will support him if uh, that was their feeling so strong. So that's why I'm here to, to let you know I've known this guy and I'm, I'm supporting the family and him. Thank you, Reverend Rains. Uh, let's hear from the uh, victim side. Uh, Brandy, would you like to come up and make a statement? Before you start, is there a gentleman by the name of, a lawyer by the name of Chip? Okay. Uh, would you like to make a statement also? No, thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Address all your remarks to the Committee on Parole and next, Mr. Duquette. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, so we're about to hear from Cajun Overcomer right now. Um, and uh, when Cajun's gonna leave her mic drop, so just keep that in mind. And uh, and again, Cajun is here watching the stream right now. She's the one that's about to speak and she's gonna come on after the hearing and give us all of the information and answer any questions from the chat. But let's jump in. My name is Brandy. 
my family and I are victims of this and me, and we strongly oppose it and we get granted parole. In 1993, he was charged with 49 counts of sexual acts with children, and these victims were all between the ages of 8 and 12. He was charged with indecent behavior with juveniles, oral sexual battery, aggravated crimes against nature, and sexual battery. Under a plea agreement, however, he was able to plead guilty to only five of those crimes. He was sentenced to a total of 30 years in prison, but then that sentence was suspended and he was placed on active supervised probation with conditions. Less than four months later, the inmate violated those terms of his probation and his sentence was imposed. Although he was convicted of five crimes, there are many other victims. My family is among those other victims. In the spring of 1990, he anally raped my brother Josh, who is pictured right here, and my oldest brother Wayne. And he also violated, he did them by oral sexual battery. At the time, my brothers were 9 and 11 years old. My family was a fairly normal family, but after my brothers were raped, we were devastated. And even though these crimes happened in 1990, my family is still suffering. After he was raped, my brother Josh developed mental and emotional problems that grew and grew. And when he was in the fifth grade, he tried to kill himself. Wayne also developed mental and emotional problems and he, after he was raped, and his way of dealing with it was to act out. Unfortunately, his way of acting out involved raping me. I was six years old. And he continued to rape me almost every night until I was 10. It should be not be surprising to learn that I still have problems from all of this. In my entire life, I have never known what it is like to feel normal. I know that I now have a completely twisted view of males and my trust in people has been ruined. My desires and abilities to have a boyfriend relationship were destroyed before they could ever develop. If this inmate would have just stayed away from my family, I think I would have had a chance at a more normal life, even after watching my mom survive a domestic violence attempted murder, which is why we came to that room. But that chance was stolen from me. Another victim of this inmate is my mother who had to endure the trauma of her two sons being raped and all the problems that it caused. Let's come out right here. What this in me did completely traumatize my entire family and changed all of our lives forever. My mother would be, my mother would be here today, but she passed away Thanksgiving Eve 2017. So on behalf of myself, my mom, my brothers Wayne and Josh, as well as his other victims, I ask that you not grant parole to this inmate. His victims continue to suffer, and he should have to serve the full sentence that he was given. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brandy. Uh, we're going to take a pause. Okay. We'll, we'll wait to the end. Uh, Madam DA. Thank you, Mr. Rocha. Good morning, Ms. Wise, Mr. Nassau. Good morning. 
Many of you know, because you've heard me speak before this board, the lengths that I go to to try to locate victims, because I don't think a proceeding like this should go forward without their voices being heard. And so fortunately, at the district attorney's office, I have some resources at my disposal and was able to locate cell phone numbers from two victims in this case. And you just heard from a victim's family who was not a named victim in this case, but you see that this man's crimes have affected those just not in the bill of information per se. But I have a statement that I would like to read to you from a victim while identified as JA because of the protections that now exist for victims that did not exist back in the 1990s. And so this man, both in, in spite of and despite that man's horrible crimes, has actually found success and is an officer in the United States military. I spoke to him Tuesday night and he said he wanted to email a statement. And I hope that I would be able to get through this because it's one of the most powerful things that I've ever read. I have copies to provide for you. And I have both the statement from a victim GB as well as JA. The JA statement says, to whom it may concern, since experiencing sexual abuse as a child, I've encountered a range of short-term and long-term effects to include guilt, shame, and blame. I felt guilty about not having been able to stop the abuse and blamed myself for experiencing physical pleasure. It is important for you, the person, to be held accountable to the fullest extent of the law, not to be reprieved for good behavior. My future intimacy and relationships were ruined due to the result of child sexual abuse. As an adult, intimacy continues to be a struggle at times. I've experienced flashbacks and painful memories while engaging in sexual activity, even though it came as a consensual and on my own terms. I've also struggled to set boundaries that have helped me feel safe in relationships. I've struggled with low self-esteem as a result of the actions of Todd Michael Duquette, my abuser, and from having personal safety violated and ignored. His actions have been detrimental to my self-esteem, directly affected my self-esteem, and negatively impacted many different areas of my life, such as my career and health. I've never heard or received an apology from Todd Michael Duquette or feel he is sincerely remorseful for his despicable acts. I am still in prison as a result and feel his release will 100% put other children in harm's way. Please do the right thing by our young children and their parents and ensuring this monster remains safely behind bars. Before I read GB's statement, I'd like to reference a statement that I know is in the record from Jay's father when he commented on this man's original sentence and thought that imprisonment was not appropriate. J.A., his son, feels very differently about that today. And this man has demonstrated by his actions because he was given the keys to the prison by Judge Irwin. Judge Irwin gave him the keys to the prison. He chose by his own actions when he violated and sexually abused a 10-year-old child in Texas, he chose to open up the jail cell. And while he said to you that he served 21 years, 10 of those years for his crime in Texas, he has served 11 years for this crime. He has in no way, shape, or form served the full sentence. I also was able to speak for about 30 minutes with GV, one of the named victims in this bill of information, and I'd like to read his statement. He also is now a member of our business community and has somehow gone on to find success and happiness, but it has been through many struggles. And he says, to whom it may concern, I personally feel it would be a great mistake allowing this individual out of prison, especially to find out that once he was released last time, he offended yet again. Words cannot describe the damage that was done to me mentally and would never want to see that happen to anyone else again. Years of drug and alcohol abuse as well as psychological factors doomed my life for nearly two decades after. I personally feel a person with such desires can never change. However, I pray that is not the case, but hope that the parole board will greatly consider my thoughts on this matter. The district attorney's office, through our assistant district attorney, Sonia Cardia Porter, voiced our strenuous opposition to this case. I urge all of you to vote no. Thank you. Ms. Barrio, again, we want to thank you for your due diligence. 
you do find victims that we can't find, and we do appreciate it. Thank you so much. And I will, of course, update victim services as well as Agent Garen with this contact information. Thank you so much. Thank you. At this time, Mr. Duquette, would you like to make a closing statement? Um, the first statement is totally false. I didn't do those things to them. I, I, I didn't do those things. Thank you, Mr. Duquette. Is the panel ready to vote? Yes, sir. Ms. Renazza. Mr. Duquette, I'm really concerned by what you just said. Uh, however, I, and let me just say this. I want to commend you on your um, ministry work that you do and are doing and have done in the faith-based community there in Angola. Uh, I want to commend you on your educational accomplishments. Uh, however, today, because of what we've heard here today, uh, the risk assessment that has been conducted that puts you uh, above the low category and the moderate to high risk, my vote today is to deny your parole. Ms. Wise. Mr. Uh, Mr. Duquette, uh, my vote is to deny for the reasons already been stated. Additionally, you have law enforcement opposition strong victim opposition and uh and you have a history of sex offenses mr Duque, you have received two votes to deny your request for early release i must agree with my colleagues this morning and my reason is for the same reasons uh mentioned by my colleagues you have received three votes to deny your request. Your request for early release has been denied. You have a good day. Wow. Wow, wow. So, um, you know, I was, um, I was hoping for, for more of a mic drop from Mr. O'Shea myself but Cajun overcomer that was a powerful impact statement that you left um what's the status of him now where is he um i'm gonna go over a few things that they didn't mention it y'all ain't gonna hear from anything else like i mentioned in my statement um my mom survived a DV strangulation where she had to be resuscitated twice. I discussed all that in the video, last video I uploaded two nights ago. Um, but we were in a small country town because my dad was working offshore. And after we spent 28 days in the shelter in Lafayette, they gave my mom the option of either coming to Baton Rouge or going to another city. And driving between New Iberia and New Orleans, where my family is from, my mom would always say she'd never live here. So she thought we would be safer here than anywhere else. And she was also kind of a fan of a mega church here that... I don't, I, I think that kind of went out the window when this happened because we spent two weeks in the shelter here and she was able to find an apartment that was in close proximity to this, I'm going to say cult. Um, and the first person that knocked on our door that Wednesday night, because we moved in that apartment on a Wednesday night and had already been going to the called for a couple of weeks when we went in the shelter. The first person that knocked on our door to take my brothers to the youth group was Todd Michael Duquette. My mom was already in a fragile and vulnerable and tra traumatized state. I mean, she was traumatized until, you know, the 
day she died, literally. Um, and when they were confronted, because we had a neighbor we went to church with, that one day she was trying to make eggs and she lived in the front of the complex and we lived in the back. And something kept telling her to go check on my brothers. And my mom had left the patio blinds kind of cracked because she had to go do volunteer work for something. More than likely one of the professors. So she needed somebody to watch my brothers because I was in New Orleans with my aunt because I wasn't functionally independent. And so he offered to do it. And my mom had no clue what would happen after. And our neighbor in the front, um, my mom asked her to keep, keep an eye on my brothers while, you know, just go check on them every once in a while to make sure everything was okay. Well, when she just so happened to walk back there and look through the blinds, I cannot begin to explain to you in YouTube appropriate language, what she said she saw, which is practically what I described. Um, and after that hearing, I walked out and I told the crime victim services people, I said, he told my mom he didn't hurt my brothers. He loved them. All he did was horse play. This woman froze. She was like, he said the same thing to the parents of the other victims. I said, I know they were all in the youth group. We all knew each other. And didn't you notice? We haven't seen each other in 29 years because that hearing was in 2019. We haven't, hadn't seen each other since all this happened. Our victim impact statements almost mirrored each other. And I didn't know if they were going to be there or they were going to send statements or what. I just knew what I was going to do when I got mine in the mail telling me that he came up for this hearing. I'm like, okay. Um, But when he said what he did, when I tell you that my oldest brother coped by doing that to me, because of Todd Michael Duquette, I had to show a sex crime detective in front of my mom that I knew how much people care her firstborn child had. That haunts me more than anything my brother did me. Not to mention I was examined for penetration by the coroner at the time. So yeah, he can sit there and deny it all he wants. Um, As you're probably going to see in the remaining stuff, he's had his residence plan revoked in 2022 that our current governor didn't even want to send a press release out to let victims before my brothers know that they could still press charges because when my mom confronted youth leadership at this cult they were refused to remove him so the other five kids got hurt but they also made sure to let my mom know they knew my brothers weren't his first victims and he was 24 years old when he hurt my brothers. But you're also going to hear about him having a residence plan revoked. And his sentence completion wasn't until 2038. But June 22nd, when I was in Kansas helping a friend of mine that had just had her first baby three days before. And I wasn't planning on coming home for a couple of months. Um, I was woke up by a notice on my phone that I had an email. That thing on my phone, so I looked at it because normally around this time of the morning, it was normally the post office because I have informed delivery on my email. Well, I looked and seen what the informed delivery was and it was that I was getting a certified letter from the prison that he was in house debt. Well, I called the prison when they opened up and I was like, I'm not home. I'm out of state helping a friend that just had our baby. What the, you know what did y'all send me? And they literally told me he was released as an immediate release June 20th. 
without an ankle monitor, and he was not placed on a curfew. And they were uh, telling me how much they followed the law. Well, um, last year we had a victim notification law passed that I was supposed to be notified, or 2022, I don't remember. Stuff happened so much in the state with politics, as y'all probably can see. It's hard for me to even keep up. Um, but I testified on the bill, so it was probably two years ago. Um, that they're supposed to notify victims 60 days in advance. So by Louisiana law, I was supposed to be notified of his release in June last April. April of 2023, when they 60 days before they released him on the 20th of 2023. And I told that lady, I went, I went rounds with her. I said, y'all didn't follow the law. And I reminded her about that 60-day victim notification law. I said, but to send me a doggone thing in, in, in my email two days after you did it, I was, I was living. So she told me to get in touch with um, the probation officer and, you know, the ones in Orleans Parish, they're subpar as far as I'm concerned when it comes to victims because his sex offender supervisor is actually doing double duty for his probation officer, who I even had to pull teeth to get the current crime victim services for the state DOC to call me or reach out to me in some kind of way because I didn't know what the heck life was going to be like for me or what I could do or what services they had to offer and everything else. And because he's high profile and he's from a church who has people woven into a lot of stuff in this city and this state, I was like, you know, I, I'm not going to talk to a random person about the intricate details of what he's done. I'm just not doing it. Um. So I talked to his sex offender supervisor who told me, to get into the parole board would have to order his curfew and his ankle monitor. I said, okay, I got them on speed dial. So I called the parole board and, you know, the lovely executive director told me he ordered the ankle monitor, but he told me putting him on a curfew would um, prevent him from being a successful citizen. I said, y'all know very well when he was in the free world before he got incarcerated. The reason he got incarcerated is because when he was in the free world at night, he was hurting children. Those boys, those five convicted Louisiana boys were all hurt during overnight stays at his house. You've seen that in those articles that you can't screen, screen share on YouTube because it has their, his address and all that. Um, all that was hap that happened on when they stayed at his house overnight on weekends. I said, all he's successful at doing overnight is hurting kids. He doesn't need to be allowed to be out of anywhere at night. Um, so right before Thanksgiving, when all the crazy stuff that was going on with the clemency hearings and all that, with the um, death penalty crap, I decided to email Mr. O'Shea because I didn't know with everything that had going on if he even knew Duquette was out of prison. So I emailed him and I was like, I don't know if you know with everything going on and I'm sorry for dropping this on you this early in the morning, but Duquette is out. And I even told him what I was told about the curfew situation. I said, he does have an ankle monitor order to my knowledge. Um, but he's not on a curfew and I don't feel safe. Not, not because of anything he could do to me. I don't want him hurting another kid. And I've told that to the media and everybody else. He can't touch me. He comes near me and he won't live to talk about it. I've, I've told him if I would have been home, even though I wasn't functionally as independent as I am now, he probably wouldn't have left my mom's apartment alive. Or if he did, he probably would have wished he wasn't. Because another thing about that, he had so much fear and stuff instilled into my brothers that because of my dad's stuff, 
My mom kept a baseball bat under her bed. And her bed was right next to the living room. Her bedroom was right next to the living room because he used to always like coming to beat on her window that was on our patio, that adjoined the patio. So we all knew what a bat was in case anything happened. But my brothers could not get him off of them to get to that bat. And I've let everybody know if I would have been home, I would have been in my room. My room was spitting distance from my mom's room. And if I would have heard that kind of mess going on, I would have went and got that bat, opened the hallway door that separated the foyer and everything from the bedroom and all that. And I would have beat the holy you know what out of him. So, yeah, I've had to deal myself with practically survivor's go for those other kids getting hurt and in no child in Texas. Which, as you notice, he pretty much tried to overlook that and pretend it didn't happen. Oh, he just moved in an apartment and ended up in jail, and he don't know why. Yeah. That's because uh, it's, it's indecent, indecent exposure with sexual contact. And Texas did not have a clue that he had Louisiana crimes. And one day, my mom was just wondering where, what was going on with him. So she called the ADA's office over here and asked, not the one that was at the hearing with me, it's just the lady that prosecuted him in 1994, and asked where he, what was going on with him. And Sue Bernie told my mom that he was in Texas. So my mom just thought he had, you know, was having a normal life. And Sue Bernie was like, no, Miss Marie, the only reason I know where he is is because he's incarcerated. Um, so they told us where he was. And so we reached out to the Texas Department of Criminal Justice and the prison where he was at. And come to find out he was coming up for parole. And my mom was like, what can I do to help y'all stop that? So my mom wouldn't text Avery or anything else, and they but they gave us an email because I was like, I will help her compose it, do whatever she's got to do. You know, I'm I'm good with email. I can do anything on the internet. I'll do it for her. I don't care. Because my mom was born in the 50s, so turning on a computer practically scared us most of the time. So we got the email. And I got her email thing set up for her to where she could send it to him. And I was going to sit there and do it for her. But I was. she told me she had it. I said, okay, I'll let if you need some help or whatever. I proofread the email she sent the first time. Thinking about it, I want to spit nails. And this was his first time up for parole probably in 03, 02, 03. And so they write him the letter at the parole hearing. Caused him to get a denial. Happened again when he came up the second time there. And then in 2008 is when his sentence is there was up. So they extradited him here. And he was in De Quincey till De Quincey had shut down. And then they moved, it, moved him to Angola where he was during his parole hearing. But Angola changed their... Uh, capacity on who they would, what inmates they were taking because they was changing to 50 and over. So they moved them in January 2021 to Rayburn. And that's where he was when the worst day of my life happened in June. I came home July 5th after having to pay to get my flight changed, which I wasn't happy about because I was thinking I would have to do a, you know, legal stuff to keep him away, even though he's restricted from Baton Rouge, because as you heard, one of his convicted victims is in the business community here, and I still live here. So he can't come anywhere near his support system, which is the cult that's like 10 minutes from my house. And because of their power in the city and the state, and I've posted videos, um, about them with other stuff that they have had removed. Because I know 
they probably have vendettas and stuff against me, which I'm I'm good. I mean, other than talking about this and all, you know, I don't really say much about them. Because I do have my limits when it comes to talking about all that kind of stuff. But his support system is that place. To this day, they defend and protect him. When I tell you how many people I've cut out of my life that I had no clue supported that place in the last four years, it's quite a lot of folks. And I've noticed that a lot of people that I never thought would lock like arms with people like them are going, you know, thinking they're the best thing since sliced bread. And after what they were in the news for in the 80s, before any of this ever happened, I don't know how anybody could have anything to do with them. But that's my personal views. Um, but yeah, he was released to Arlene's parish June 20th um, to a transitional housing sanction by Catholic Charities, who they told me open took him with open arms. And I was even told that the rescue mission wouldn't even take him. But this new place took him with open arms. And I was like, that if he ever, God forbid, um, violates, which I'm kind of glad that he can get in trouble for doing stuff that doesn't involve hurting another child, but I'm just glad my mom's not alive to see this and live in this reality because Todd Michael Duquette used to be her fight. I did the domestic violence stuff for her because that was too hard for her. A few days before she passed, she told me that she kept him in Texas. I would have to keep him in jail here. I looked at her like she was crazy, but I knew she was about to go, and I knew stuff like that happens. And I didn't know that a uh, couple of, about a year and a half later, what she said would be the reality of my life. And I've also done stuff at the legislature inspired by him to protect other kids from being hurt by people like him. So as hard as it is, and as sad as it is that talking about him has become second nature to me, I hope that not only that he realizes touching my, my blood was the worst mistake of his existence, I hope, like, you know what, um that Louisiana Im starts improving their laws when it comes to protecting kids from being sexually abused, especially by people in the church. I mean, we have a priest in New Orleans who's 90 something years old, who is doing a lot of malingering because he doesn't wanna be prosecuted for the crimes he committed way back when. Um, He's faking like he can't do a lot of stuff, which People are saying he's malingering, which I believe he is, because they don't want to face justice for it. I said, well, when he takes his last birth, that's eternal justice. You can't wake up from So if it happens on this earth, which I hope it does for the sake of his victims, fine. But if it doesn't, he's going to face eternal justice when he takes his last birth that nobody's going to have to worry about. But yeah, I'm sorry I rambled. You didn't ramble. Thank you for... <laughs> For sharing with the community. I don't know if you see the, the comments section, the chat section, but everybody is. I'm sorry, I wasn't looking at it. I can't. I can't. Can, focus. No, yeah. no, it was. You, you can go back and look, but it, it's it's um, it's very powerful to hear from you. And 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 you are right. He's uh, it was his biggest mistake. Um, and you never believed that when I was six, when my brother messed with me and all this happened, I was the shyest thing. You, could, My mom couldn't even pay me to say hello to people I knew. <laughs> when I tell people I was very shy, they, they don't believe that. I, my foster mom, I reunited with her last year. I was shy when I was in and spent 11 days with her family. She couldn't believe because I had one of the senators that go, she goes to church with do a resolution for everything she's done. And she couldn't believe it. She said, probably she was thinking of all the kids she had. Me? Yeah. 
I said I said I've been in politics since uh, 2008, but I guess it came for a reason because not only with this, with the child predator crap. I don't know if anybody's paid attention to that DV strangulation thing I posted the other day. The shelter couldn't even get me to talk about what I watched my dad do my mom. When I was sitting in the first committee and they said that the max penalty for that since 2014 was three years, I was like, hell no. Um, but now it's because of my loud mouth. It's minimum eight, max 50. So it's worth it. Um, and for uh, everybody's question on the last video, his sentencing judge died June 2022 of natural causes. The guy was 72 years old and his uh, prosecuting ADA who refused to do anything to my brother because he was a victim of the care, which I totally understand. But the woman could have got him on a lot of stuff because I was considered infirm because I was not functionally out. I have a lot of problems from surviving domestic violence in the world talking to me you wouldn't believe it but you know um but she refused to prosecute him because he was a victim of duquette which i get it's just you didn't you refused to prosecute him back then so he's gone on to have his life in federal prison now because he couldn't keep his stuff to himself because nobody got him help back then um so Judge Irvin is deceased and his prosecuting ADA retired in 2015 and she no longer lives in this state, which I'm happy about. Okay. I, uh, I pulled up on the, on the screen, um, the video that you had uploaded. That's, uh, so, so is this your, this, is a piece of legislation that you lobbied for and got passed about the minimum Wait, before the session started before the session started you know we was doing they they was focusing on the the death row stuff from this crime session that's mainly what they wanted but um so right before when the uh Right before the set regular session started, I was just looking at the bills like I always do on that subject. And I seen that and I was like, okay, I knew the legislator that was carrying the bill because she's also the one that did the victim notification. But my other friend, one of my other friends told me what DA was do getting it done. And when I heard it was somebody in that parish, I was like, this is poetic justice because that's the same parish that I always had to give my dad a slap on the wrist because the laws were so jacked up. So when I seen that, I'm like, okay, I've never talked about this a day in my life, but I knew I had to, I, I could not, not talk about it. I mean, yeah, they probably could have got it passed without me, but even in the email that I got from the ADA, he was like, because of what I, my courage and stuff, they got it passed without opposition. Amazing. And, and I, I have, I don't really like taking credit for that, but I mean, because what inspired that bill is they had a jury in that parish a couple of years ago whose victim, the victim, was strangled and had serious bodily injury. And the jury had a problem computing it to. They, they, they didn't think, they didn't understand that when you strangle somebody, you cut blood flow off to the brain. So it causes serious problems if it doesn't kill you. My mom had to be resuscitated twice. She had problems till the day she died because of what that, that happened to her. So when that bill came up, I was like, I can't be quiet. But I told him, I said, uh, I don't know if you realize the second hearing, when I talked, the last one, I was fighting. I, I sat up there fighting through a seizure, but I was willing to take that sacrifice to get that done. But yeah. 
No, I, 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 I did not realize it. It's, um, I think you're the definition of survivor. <laughs> um, and the, and one on, the one on the screen was the first one. The ADA from Jefferson Parish is the guy sitting at the table next to the representative. Right there on the screen now. Yeah. And, um, that, that was the first committee. The second one when she, Revelio was in her red outfit, that's when I was having a seizure. And I really thought because I have epilepsy from brain trauma from the deviant hero. So I thought I didn't sleep the night before that hearing. And for me, sleep deprivation is a seizure trigger. I was fine through that. I slept the whole night before the second one. So I thought I was going to be okay. My body said, uh-uh. But I fought through it anyway. And it was signed in the law and goes in effect uh, April first. Amazing. How 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 did Duquette get released? It wasn't through a parole hearing. It was through. No, um, when he was convicted back in ninety four, the laws in this state, which I see a lot of y'all's comments on the uh, hearings you do <laughs> about this crazy <laughs> jacked up state. I, trust me, I agree with a lot of it. I live here. I've lived here my entire life. I've been in this political crap since 2008. I've had to learn so much, more stuff than I've wanted to about these kinds, you know, this crime and the laws. And since my mom's been gone, that I even want care to. But when he was convicted in 1994, they only had to serve 50% of their sentence and they were eligible for good time. And they told us in 2022, when I had his residence plan revoked at the last minute, because the spokesperson at DOC and DOC itself doesn't like my friend at Channel 2, who now has a job at a national media firm, Chris. Um, they didn't think that I would do anything to stop, you know, but him from getting out that time, I don't know why. But um, DOC was still going through the COVID stuff where the male people were, not DOC. So I was waiting for the notice about the release in my email. I, I mean, to come to my door. So I had missed a hard walk in 2022 waiting on this notice because if I wasn't here when they tried to deliver it to my door, they probably would have sent it back to the prison and I would have had to go through all that craziness. And I didn't want to do that. So I missed the hard walk. I didn't know that the post office was still going by the pandemic protocol of sticking that kind of stuff in your box. So on the first, I tried, I went to my box and I got this thing out of my box because that's what Chris was waiting on to do the story because I told him I knew it was happening, but he was waiting on the document. And when I got it, we scheduled the interview that he did with me downtown. And... I walked up to him. I walked up to him and I seen I, I I witnessed him very heated with somebody about this. And it was somebody apparently trying to defend the the um, residence plan situation. I'm sure you've seen in the news report how in depth Chris went. But um before that happened, I had been in touch with the um, probation people and all of that in the parish he was going to be sent to. So I had already had his ankle monitor and all that. I had that in the bag. It was going to happen whether he walked out of prison with it or not. They they was already ready for it. And so Chris does the story. I get home and in my email... I have an email saying his his residence plan is no longer a go. <laughs> because apparently in between that interview and whatever happened after that, DOC got worried that the media was on top of it still. But they should know I'm not the one. And this dude will never breathe there without having to be haunted by what he did, my brothers. 
he probably wasn't expecting me to be at the parole hearing because I was shy, a shy six-year-old back then. But, you know, times have changed. And good for you to, to be there. And uh, I wish I could have seen his face. Um, and the I would have loved to have seen his face. Yeah. <laughs> he, pr he probably thought he probably thought he was a uh, smooth smooth sailing when he was released. But he, he found out two days later because I was sitting. It was I did an interview with my friend here, Chris's part uh co-worker. Um I did the interview with her from Kansas. They used a lot of you know footage from the year before the year before. But I did the interview with her from sitting in front of my friend's doctor's office. And after that, my friend, it took me, you know, because when I tell you that I was a literal, I was probably having a breakdown and didn't realize it. But I try, I was having a breakdown trying to stay sane because my friend has a lot of kids. And I had to keep my composure around them. But she ended up taking me to her by myself to a, a little like diner type thing. And I called the sex offender supervisor and was talking to him. And he was like, I've never had a victim ask me to put more stipulations on a on a roach like you're doing. I said, sir, when you realize who you're dealing with, you will probably understand. And that's when I had to tell him who I was. And I know that Duquette is very vindictive toward me and all that. I'm like, I don't care. He has a reason to be. But at the end of the day, he should have never touched my brothers, and he probably wouldn't be in the situation he's in. So that guy also told me to contact the parole board is who would have to order the stuff. I said, okay. So he 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 walked around freely for a couple of days, but uh by he got out on a Tuesday and by that Friday he he had an ankle monitor ordered at night nine something that morning. So they probably put it on me either that Friday or the following Monday. I was also stalking the state registry to make sure he registered because I know he has like 72 hours to register. I say, if you're not registered by 5 p.m. Friday, your butt going back to jail. Because I even told the prison, I said, oh, keep keep his bed open because he'll be back. Um, so that's when that happened. And, but, and I don't know if they told him that I'm the one that had that order, but you know, if he does the math, if he's got any a lick of sense in his brain, he probably knows. And then he thought he was freely going to go probably, you know, with supervision, but freely roam wherever he could at, at night. Well, he if, if he went anywhere at night, that kind of ended the week before Thanksgiving. Because uh, in Mr. Roche's email to me, he said, Miss Brandy, I will take care of this immediately. So, yeah, he had a curfew immediately put on him the week before Thanksgiving. I heard I heard Mr. Roche's voice, too. Miss Brandy, <laughs> I'll take care of it immediately. I <laughs> when I read the email, I heard him say that, too. I almost wanted to talk and be like, thank you. <laughs> he is he is great. And 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 Kajun, um, I have like 10 minutes left on the live before I want to go. So is there anything that you want to do in the final 10 minutes? Um, um, do you want to answer questions? Do you want to, how do you want to use this? Um, let's see. Would you, would you want to play any of the media things or you want me to just answer yeah, questions? Yeah, we can play it. I mean, it's, it's, you want to play the, where, where he was, where he loses um, his, his residency plan? Play the residency plan and the one where the last, the release. The release. And if you want to do your commentary and then I'll answer questions. All right. If so anybody we'll, says yeah. anything, because I've tried to cover everything I've seen, because I honestly tried to keep up with everybody's comments and questions on the first one that you did, but I literally couldn't. 
I mean, y'all see how crazy Louisiana politics is, and I, that's priority to me during the session, so I just couldn't juggle everything I had to do. Plus, I had doctor's appointments. Yeah, so um, I guess the revocation and the uh, release, and then you could do your commentary, and um, I'll answer questions if anybody has them. All right, let's go. Um, but I totally apologize for talking so much. No, please don't apologize. We're all here to listen to your story. Um, okay, so let's do the the the. Uh, we did the parole interview. Now we're going to do the residency plan that's revoked. Um, so here that is. Let's go. Multiple boys in the 90s is now walking free, released 15 years before his sentence was supposed to be up. News Chief's Best Casterly spoke to the family of two of those victims. Best, they say this Department of Corrections is making a mistake. Yes, yeah, Sylvia, Todd Michael Ducan has proven at least once before that he cannot be changed. Molesting another child during sex offender rehab before serving his 30 year sentence. But earlier this week, he was released for being a, quote, model prisoner. Yeah, he was a model inmate in jail, but when he's in the free world, he's not. Brittany Melissa is an indirect victim of Todd Michael Duquette. He was convicted of molesting at least five boys in East Baton Rouge Parish in 1994, including two of Melissa's brothers. Eleven days before Christmas, the year it happened, my, one of my brothers attempted suicide during recess at school. When they asked him why, explained what happened. My other brother coped by molesting me. We spoke to Melissa in this interview last year when Duquette was up for early release. However, the Department of Corrections denied that release when the landlord changed his mind about housing him once he was free. Melissa was relieved, but this week, all that changed. Absolute terror. Despite a law requiring that victims be notified of offenders' releases at least 60 days in advance, she received an email today saying Ducant was released the day before. There's no, there's nothing they could have stopped them from keeping him to 2038. Mm -hmm. I don't know why they're taking a risk. The Department of Corrections says they okayed his release because he served more than half his time and was eligible for good time parole, according to Louisiana law. And this time around, he has a place to stay upon release. Melissa says she was advised by Duquette's parole officer that he will not be on an ankle monitor unless the parole board orders it. Keep your kids completely away from him. And if you see him around the child, turn his ass in because he's not walking around with being monitored. The Department of Corrections says Duquette will be living at a place that houses sex offenders in New Orleans. He's also required to register as a sex offender with the Orleans Parish Sheriff's Office. At the newsroom, Best Casserly, WBRZ. New um, also, before it ends, can you add his uh, uh, triple mugshot that has his most recent picture so people yeah. will know what he looks like today? Yeah, you should definitely do that. And for the people asking about good time, yeah, um, he was convicted in 1994 and laws have changed. So, and about getting my name wrong, um, I legally do not use my last name for safety reasons, but I said it so low. My doctors can't pronounce my last name correctly. And that fool hasn't seen, hadn't seen me in 29 years and he did it perfectly. So yeah, that didn't, that that right there to me proved he knew he was guilty. He just wasn't gonna sit there and admit it. That that right that picture on his release thing, we didn't have his sex offender registration at that time. So that's the only one. That's the latest one they had. Um, that was from when he came back from Texas in two thousand eight. Did we lose you? I'm I'm here. Okay, so I have his uh, his photos up there on the screen. Um, the one that's showing right now is his uh, mugshot from when he came back here. The one on the 
the, the three of them. That that one there where he's looking down, that's from his Texas. The one where he's got the smirk on his face, that is from the one when he came back here. The one where he looks like he's emaciated, that is his sex offender registration, which is also a good thing. His um, supervisor told him that he's walking, he's on thin ice. This man makes him register every three months. Well, hopefully he'll get revoked soon, right? I just hope if he ever does again that it's not for hurting another child. Right. But he can get revoked for the smallest of anything. Um, Jim, he's not not a classified register yet, but he'll probably be lifetime when they they do. Uh, I think I think this goes without saying that the entire community would love nothing more than to than to uh, unpack his revocation hearing. <laughs> um, I would love it too. But for everybody asking me about the pastor of the cult, no, it's the, it's the cult on Blue Bonnet in Baton Rouge. I'm just not going to say it because I don't want to get a uh, man dude's channel thing because them people are very vindictive. Thank you, Kizu. But, but um, the cult on Blue, look up the uh, churches on Blue Bonnet Boulevard in Baton Rouge and you can do the math and figure it out yourself. This place was also in the national news in the late 80s for so you can figure that out yourself I'm not going to say it because I don't want to get his channel thing because honestly man do is a big hero to a lot of people okay well thank you Kijun that made my day <laughs> I mean <laughs> oh you might um so, so yeah I think I think the you can the, do your commentary. The only the only hero here is is uh, is Kajun Overcomer. Um, it's very special for for me and the community to be able to listen to you. And if you haven't checked out her channel, she has a channel where um, we got her over a thousand subscribers. So please do subscribe to it, um, and you can keep track with what Kajun's doing in yeah that, that, that picture right there. Yeah. Right. The bot the bottom right picture on the one you have on the screen right now, that's his latest. That's pro he probably looks like that from what whatever happened to him while he was in prison because of what he is. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's uh Jailhouse Justice as they say. It's oh we got Nicole. Thank you, Nicole, for subscribing. Jesse says that you're a hero. Um, Tanya joined as a new member. Debbie says you're amazing. Pitbull Mama says you are a hero. Thank you so much for being here with us and telling your story. So do you, you have anything to add? Um... It's uh, you know, we're familiar with this story. Like as you said, we we had we had done the, the prior parole hearing. Um do, and do you have anything to add to this I, craziness? Do I have anything to add? It's it's um You know, I, I, I think that you've you said it all. It, it it's of course the system's broken. We, you know, we know that by now. Um, the idea that he's not locked up, that he's walking free, it's just insane. It's absolute madness. Um, and I think the more people that realize this and, 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 and become aware of how broken the system is, I think that's the quickest way to make change possible. I think that many people don't don't you know put two and two together. Maybe that hey, that they, they can vote into office. They're they're judges. They're DAs. Mm -hmm. 
the people in charge. And, um, and those judges and DAs have kind of different, they seem to at least have different agendas, right? They're not, it, it's not, it's not about actually protecting those who can't protect themselves. It's more about, uh, records and, and press releases and really manipulation of the truth so they can get reelected or do whatever it is that they want to do. So this, you speaking out and us sharing this with the public and the public seeing this, I think that that's, that that's how ch change can come about. One little step at a time. Yep. Even in this backward state that prioritizes criminals' rights over victims most of the time. I mean, you even seen that the other day in the parole hearing where the um, Randy tried his hardest to keep someone who caused a domestic violence with injury offender locked up and he was granted parole. Like, I, I can't get over that. I can't either. And, and do, it, the people do so good. In jail. They absolutely they, they, the they do. do so good in jail, but what about? <laughs> I don't care what you do in jail. You, you you could do it all the good you want to in jail. I don't care. You still have victims out here, and we don't need future ones. Stay where you are. Yeah, it, it, exactly. It's it's in, it's insane when they say, "Well, you're you're a medium risk to reoffend, or you're a, a moderate, or whatever it is." It's like, "Well, or I'll take a chance on you." That's something the parole board sometimes says. <laughs> and I, how can you take a chance? You're gonna take it. Oops! Well, he offended. Now he altered the life of someone else, another child, a whole family, generations, because you wanted to take a chance. And it, and it's. It's who benefits, who benefits by um, by taking that chance. No one but the the, the cockroach, no one but the predator. And Duquette, there's no logic in that. Duquette told Judge Urban in 1994 when Judge Urban gave him the 30 year suspended sentence and let him go to Teen Challenge. He told me when he agreed that he would not be caught with minors unsupervised again. He completed Teen Challenge with flying colors in Michigan. Landed in tech, went to Texas for God knows what reason, and did what he did. It's like you lied to the judiciary. That should be another charge on top of anything else you get. But they didn't care about that. Uh, no. <laughs> they don't care. Mm-mm. And uh, I agree, Heather, the programs, it's, it's really, it's like, well, you, you took a sex offender program, so you're, you're healed now. And it's, it's like, no, it doesn't work that way. Their he brains are Bible wired. College. He <laughs> was in Bible college when he got access to his Louisiana victims. I, I don't know what they taught him in class. But um, he was literally in Bible college when he got access to his Louisiana victims. If you. And they saying, oh, education can deter this. Really? <laughs> He's a Bible college graduate. That didn't deter him. He no. completed the team challenge successfully. That didn't deter him. No, of course not. No. I, I just covered a disturbing hearing on, on Mandy, too. A Connecticut hearing. I, I didn't play it yet. I'll do it next week. I love you, but Connecticut gets under my skin. <laughs> it gets under all of our skins. It actually makes Louisiana look look look. It does. <laughs> you know, the truth is, um, Kejun, is that covering covering Utah, covering Iowa, covering Connecticut, I have a much deeper appreciation for Louisiana. They make a lot of mistakes. They do a lot of things that get us mad. But compared mm -hmm. to those states, they are the best. And I think they are trying as a state. They are genuinely trying to do better. Um, they still have a lot of work to do, but I do think that True. compared to the other states, they're, they're which <laughs> um, and 
And I, I do love Miss Stapleton. She's a true survivor's advocate. And I see that you spend a lot of time with her. Oh, wow. We're good friends. I love that woman. She's great. If here it wasn't are. for her, I probably wouldn't have been able to even be notified about his hair and much less offended. And, and so if, it was, it wasn't, if it wasn't for her, he probably would have walked in 2019. Oh, really? Well, that, yeah, because as I explained in that video where we were sitting next to each other, he is the reason because my, he wasn't convicted of what he did, my brothers. And they only allowed, at the time before she did what she did, they only allowed the victims of the crime of conviction to be notified of anything that goes on. But any now she did something, passed a law or something, and now all victims, convicted or not. Because like with uh, the South Louisiana serial killer, even everybody knew he killed all the people he killed, they only went to trial on one. So all the other ones wouldn't have been able to participate. But because of the, the laws changing, all of his victims' families were allowed to have a say in what went on, even though he was on, he only had the trial on one or two of them. But he ended up dying of natural causes like a few years ago. So, yeah. They're improving, but they're kind of doing it too slow for my nerves. Things definitely do move slowly in legislation, but hopefully, my, hopefully my hair grows faster than these laws improve for victims, and that's not saying much. <laughs> um, yeah, on that note, I, I have uh, I'm running a few minutes late to doing my my um for, for what I need to do as a father here. So who uh, is, is there, are there any parting words that you want to give the community before we go? I, I really don't feel worthy to be talking to you, honestly. Um, <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> I really don't. Um, worthy to be talking to a little old man, do? <laughs> Kejun, you, you sit don't, in front you don't, of you. You don't realize because a lot in a lot of states, including my own, you know, this quote unquote pro-life state protect ki vic kids victims are priority even in this state victims especially of child sex predators whether they from churches or anywhere family or whatever and for those wondering I'm not related to Todd Michael Duquette he'd be sorry if I was um but even for victims of child sex crimes in this state they are not given a voice. It's like whatever happens to them, they either suffer in silence or if, you know, when they go to court and do all the prosecutions and all that stuff goes on, the legal process, they don't always get the justice they deserve. I'm lucky to for him to have had that suspended sentence. I'm lucky that I had a media person sitting in his parole hearing because if a media person wasn't sitting in that room, I don't doubt he probably would have walked. Um, but you and everything you do, especially when it comes to roaches, you give victims hope that one day they will see justice and this stuff is going to be taken more seriously than it is. Because when a child is violated, that's a lifelong sentence. My brother messed with me because of Duquette when I was six years old. I'll be 41 in September. And there are times that it, like, it's almost worse than the experience of climbing through my mom's window and finding that she had succumbed to DV trauma. It's a lifelong thing. And it comes back at you when you least expect it. And since... June 20th of 2023, I've had to rearrange my life in ways that I never thought I would. Um, but yeah, you are a hero. And everybody keep fighting, spreading the word. I mean, even if you got to do, you know, speak up on platforms when it comes to stuff that's in the news. 
do it because speaking up for a victim when their supporters and others are trying to silence them and cover stuff up and shove it under the rug and pretend it never happened. Victims need a voice. And man, do you give us a big one and that is very much appreciated. So yeah, I kind of don't feel worthy to be talking to you. But if you're wondering where, when I started watching you was when you did the hearing for uh, the Galbraith person from here. One of the media people was wondering how his hearing went, and you, I had found it on YouTube, and it was your video coverage. So I was able to send it to him, and that's how they realized what had happened with that. So, yeah, you're kind of famous with a lot of people around here. Well, Cajun, you're, you're, I, you are worthy to talk with everyone to everyone and i i understand you're saying it as a way of um flattering me and but i, I watch you stand up in the in the halls of louisiana and tell your truth and fight for other survivors in front of a room packed full of senators and governors and um you are very brave and you inspire us and but the words that you told me about it, 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 it means the world to me. And I, uh, I appreciate you saying it. Um, and thank you for coming on and sharing your story with us. It means a lot to the community and it's what drives us to continue showing these hearings and we're going to keep on going. I hope you do. I'm going to stop. Thank you. If Louisiana ever tries to mess with you again, please let me know. Oh, I know you got my back. I, I do. I couldn't yeah. believe they messed with you to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully, hopefully, uh, hopefully they don't again. And, and as, as they say, not all heroes wear wear capes. And uh, but Cajun, I would love to see you show up to your next meeting wearing one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Want to. I, think I could arrange that. Do <laughs> you do it for us? That would be great. And I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to the recording and listen to to what you said um, because it really does mean a lot to me and I'll treasure that forever. And with that, I'll let you go. All right. Have a good day. <laughs>